Nate Nickerson, uh, I, I know there are questions out here, but you touched on something that uh, uh, that really hit home at a gut level uh, for me. I've been a reporter a lot longer than I've been a college teacher. And I take exception to the characterization of journalists in these situations as voyeurs. And I wonder if any of the other members of the panel have any thoughts on whether we're voyeurs or Nate, if you'd like to yeah. expand on that. Yeah, no, I didn't. Um, I, let me just clarify that I was talking about that there's a range of media uh, quality. And I tried to identify the, the qualities that I think are good media coverage. When those are not met, uh, particularly when there's a lot of, there's a lot of incentive to, to generate the most uh, extreme kind of examples and images, I think what it does is it caters to a sort of voyeurism in, in the public that, that's looking at your media. I don't think I call the media voyeur, but I think that, the, that there's a type of journalism I think we can acknowledge exists that caters to that kind of uh, uh, popular uh, interest within the community. That's what I, I, what I meant. I don't know if that clarifies it at all. It may be still uh, uh, objectionable. But. The, the only point I'd, I'd make in response to that is that I know how I do my job and I know how Jane and Carrie do theirs. And no one agonizes more over the picture to take, the picture to use, the sound bite to use, the context, the very important thing that you talked about, uh, than those of us who do this. I, anybody else have any, any thoughts I, on this, this I, tension, I, I Larry think, Rona? I think part of, the, uh, part of this, this issue has to do with our familiarity, I mean, our, the medical profession's familiarity with journalism and understanding its needs and its goals. And that's why I'm saying that that, that relationship has to be thought about more now that we've somehow come to a marriage uh, in the field. And whether it's being embedded in Iraq or it's being uh, or in Afghanistan or coming down to the disaster, I don't think we and I'll speak for me, but um, but I don't think we, the medical profession, really understands you very well, and and what you're going through and what your needs are and what your focus is and how you do wrestle with these things. I know I never got any training in that, and so when we finally encounter one another in the field in a disaster, whether it's a war or Haiti or whatever. I, it's that's not really the time to process that relationship. So I'd go back to my, <laughs> I, I'd go back to my original comment, which is I think some preparedness training uh, around this would be helpful for both sides. There's no military here, but I can guarantee you the military would say the exact same thing, which is they have they they have to be you have to be with them now in a lot more ways than they've ever been accustomed to. And then they have to also, and I'll just say this, deal with you as you try to figure out what it is to be shot at and or you know you're 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 doing a cell phone from from the combat zone or what have you from their standpoint it, it, you know that's an incident command structure and you do what you're told but from your standpoint you're covering a story and there's sort of freedom this license so there's this inherent tension i think in the medical profession military whatever when you're in very controlled rigid areas of having people who have freedom to look then the second part of that is 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 reporters do have lots of needs in the field and and having some preparedness training around that including your emotional response PTSD and all that I think would be helpful and I think that gets at a little bit of what we're saying. Yeah. Dr. Onyango anything on that? Yes uh, I think uh, like I said is, is the kind of training we have and uh, you know like like my colleague says it's this is a good beginning for us to begin finding ways on you know how our work intersects because Traditionally, what we know is if, a, mid, if a, a journalist comes, I'm a midwife and I'm in a maternity, I see them as an interference, bottom line, that's what it is. And I see them as people who are going to misreport or expose my patients unnecessarily. So we really need to learn how to embrace each other and how to, to know that we, I need a journalist the way I need a nurse assistant, for example. And that has not been done, and I don't know whether it's really going to happen, but we need to find ways of, you know, embracing each other because that, what Nate says is the common feeling around mm. professionals who are not journalists. And where, where, where do we intersect? And th that's the trouble. Dr. James. 
I agree with everyone, um, actually. And <laughs> re no, I do. I really do. And I was thinking, um, you know, generally when it, on on the on our disaster team, um, Dr. Ronan was saying there's no uh, no there's no training for us. Uh, the training we have is not to speak to the media um, unless you know given you know direct permission um, but I think you know people are generally sort of maybe suspect or whatever when the media comes around because you don't know how it's going to come out on the other side and if they're seeing through the same lens as you and whether there's going to be this sensationalism and <clears throat> so um, I agree I think there needs to be um, some formalized um, development of the marriage and, and uh, coming up with, uh, you know, this is a good start, coming up with um, some sort of process to go forward. Larry, uh, just to, to, we, we don't understand one another, and I don't say that in a bad way. I'm just saying that there are ethics to journalism and, and as well as performance goals, if you will, and there are ethics to what we do. Carrie told the story of, of giving the cell phone to that injured Marine. And it was a very touching story about the human response to that. I know what the lieutenant colonel of that battalion was thinking as he watched that cell phone go to that Marine, that Iran was targeting that cell phone, and an incoming will come in in the next five minutes and eliminate all of them. So we have different goals, different things. At that moment, it was the human experience for that Marine, for the, the window Marine and carry. But for the people in charge, it was protection, security, and what have you. Those are two different systems now in a very dangerous situation. So we need to understand that relationship a bit more and understand and respect each other in that. Ladies and gentlemen, yes. Hi, um, sorry. I was wondering, sort of along the lines of what Dr. Anyango was talking about with humanitarian response and disaster response, maybe needing to be more professionalized, because I know for medical professionals here in the US, when you're back at your hospitals and your clinics, the media only shows up when there's some sort of situation that was probably far from ideal that occurred. No one shows up mm -hmm. at Mass General every day to celebrate all the births that went well. So as we have providers that leave these situations where their interactions with the media are generally not of the most pleasant sort, going to disasters, how the relationship with the media at home in your day-to-day -day life may or may not affect these situations that are abnormal um, where everyone's sort of there and the media is obviously there because it's a story that can have both positive and negative implications. Anybody? I think the same things apply, you know, um, even, even at home. Because the one thing, as I said earlier, um, that I learned from going to Haiti was it opened my eyes about what was actually going on at home. I actually thought that we were not having an objective perspective on the patients we're looking at every single day because we, you know, they're different. We don't understand their lives are different from our lives and that type of thing. So I don't think the rules of engagement are that different at, uh, at home or in the field. Yes, ma'am. I kind of wish we had a print reporter up on the panel, you know, or presentations mm. because I think there's a real difference in the way print Pad and pencil versus broadcast microphone. I, I, I really think that there's, I mean, when you think about if you have a, a video and in your need to have something really compelling, I think, again, about the last 10 years in Haiti that I've been there and what I've seen on the ground and what I've seen visually in the media are really, what I've seen are the most extreme and usually negative images that have been returned. So what is the... Why is that? What's the impetus for that? What is the, why is it that those are the images that are widely distributed and not the fuller context of what's going on? Be, there's, there's an inherent need to have something exciting visually. And I think, and, and I think there's the time issue. You, need, you have deadlines, you need to get them up, I assume. I, I'm not a journalist. But I, I agree that 
it hasn't been quite the same experience with the written with the written media. Dr. James, you had something? No. no? Okay. Yes, in the back here. Maybe we can get the microphone to you if we can. There's something limiting about, I mean, we have the, the people that, on the ground here talking about the complexity. At the same time, we're talking about video and, and TV and its limitations and what we can do with that video is, is the comment right there. So we're addressing that. The other part that we're not addressing that actually interests me from a previous panel that um, I was with on disasters and planning in the media um, was making the difference between the journalist and the media outlet. And I'd like to hear more about, from the journalists, about how the how the media outlet your your boss shapes or mm -hmm. conditions what it is that you say or what kind of incentives because no one I don't think anyone here would comment or say that you're not no one you're not agonizing over it mm -hmm. um, and and that's that's the person that's the journalist doing the the with his or her craft but then there's this media corporate the the media infrastructure the system that has a media <laughs> mediating role in how your story or the stories get portrayed to the public. And the, and that, the danger here is that we, we still lump the media and everyone in the media into one category. And so if we disaggregate it, how, do we, how, does, that you know, that, how does that exercise get us at a, a better playing, an even playing field, or a better way to kind of have this dialogue so it's not so contentious? Because I didn't necessarily hear, I can see your point, and I see um, um, uh, Mr. Nickerson's point, and um, there are points in common, but there, the tension, I, I see that's where the tension comes about, but there's something else more in common. And if we disaggregate what is the media the, versus the journalist, then I wonder if we can get somewhere beyond. Uh, Jane, would you like to address that, that, that issue? Sure. Uh, you know, when we do hit the ground running in a place like Haiti, uh, I happen to work with somebody who has a beat, whose beat is science and medicine. So we know what our goals are going in. Um, and, and, you know, you have to trust the outlet. You know, TMZ is certainly going to report the Haiti incident much different than we are. Maybe they'll focus on Sean Penn or Ben Affleck going in to Haiti, whereas, you know, we'll focus on the efforts of a clinic like Gescue, uh, who has been treating AIDS patients and who has now become, you know, the central location for uh, treating amputees or the homeless. So, you know, I, I, there are so many media outlets now and so many websites and so many people you don't know asking you a question, putting a camera into your face. Um, you just have to be smart about how you answer. You know, we'd like to think that you trust us to put on. You know, sometimes you may be disappointed with what other outlets do. <laughs> um, but w one of the questions that I had for the panel also is is covering emerging disease emerging diseases uh, that come from crisis, things like malaria or cholera. Um, and why they're so very difficult for us to cover. You know, we're talking about having to fill two or three minutes um, about a disease where people have diarrhea. You know, we have to get something visual. We have to get something that's compelling and and can't show all the all the naughty bits. You know, so while we'd like to uh, cover those things more, it is a challenge for us, and that's where we need your, your advice and cooperation. May I just also respond to your, that, that question as well? At NECN, New England Cable News here in Boston, uh, our goals were pretty straightforward, and we talked about them going into what we knew was going to be extensive coverage over a period of probably several weeks. First of all, what happened? What's the scope of this disaster? And secondly, for us as essentially a New England network, how do we bring this story home? Boston is home to the third largest Haitian community in the country. We tried to tap into those resources to get the kind of context that Nate is talking about this morning, to bring that story home in a meaningful and we hoped constructive way. Those were our marching orders. We need to wrap here fairly soon, but we have let's let's we got to keep going here. This is too um, good. 
My name is Jamil Simon. I've been in Haiti since May, last May. I just came back a couple of weeks ago. And Nate touched on a remarkable but really unknown aspect of this whole crisis is the incredible media campaign that went to help reduce fatalities in cholera. Um, and I, I think it's something maybe that we, I can only kind of point to it and highlight it, but uh, I was working with the Haitian government and there was a massive effort when they discovered that there was cholera to get information out because information, interestingly enough, was the only cure. Cholera kills in f four hours for a child or eight hours to an adult, but if you do the right thing in the right amount of time, you can save people with relatively simple um, uh, cures. I mean, Gatorade, in effect. I mean, rehydration, rehydration, and and if necessary uh, antibiotics. Um, and so the information campaign, which was massive. I mean, uh, we we people in Haiti got cell phone messages every day about hygiene, about um, what to do if somebody gets, if they know gets sick. Um, it was on the newspapers every day, it was in the radio every day, it was reported every day. Um, we had at our ministry, the culture and communications, we had daily con press conferences once it broke. Um, and that lasted for two weeks. Uh, and then pretty often after that, but um, we got information out, and information in this case save lives. I've, it's power. It's power. And, but it really, I, I, I've been, I work all over the world in development communications, and I've never seen anything like this. And when, when I give talks about communication, I often say, well, if it's going to really work well, it should fall on like rain. And I, this was the best example of information falling like rain because it came from everywhere. Thank right, you. Point made. Let's try and get a couple more in before we break. Yes. Can I just complicate that for a second. Um, hi, I, my name is Stephanie Friedhoff. Uh, I worked with a journalist who we had assigned um, on the cholera story, actually, and the information that has not been that had not been reported in that time period was the identification of the strain and that the epidemic had been caused by UN peacekeeping forces. And was, journalists were struggling, that was suppressed, exactly. And as a journalist, you were in that situation. We had a reporter in who was in a hospital that had been under siege by people who had been frustrated and had gotten all kinds of misinformation and were hungry and desperate. And the journalist struggled with what kind of information do you give out in that situation, knowing it can be inflammatory. So you're saying information needs to get out, but the reporters are always dealing in these kinds of situations with what the official version is of the information that public health officials think should be communicated, and then there are all the other facts. I mean, I was simultaneously having conversations with scientists here who said, I can't believe they're not communicating this. We know where this is coming from. Only people in Haiti don't know where this is coming from. Right. Can I respond to that? Very quickly. We want to get, let's get a couple I'll of people. I'll just say, Very I think quickly. that was a gross error on the UN's part, not to, to own that. But uh, the Ministry of Health actually said, listen, we've got a crisis, and that's not the most important issue. And I think they were correct in that, but um, because the real important, the real urgent message that needed to get out was how to cure the disease and, and to give people the information they needed to, to work with it. But I, I, I think that aspect was a total failure. I yes, think. in front here. I have a question for the panelists. There's obviously a balance between there's obviously a balance between um, praising the first responders and their ability to help uh, in, a, in case of a disaster, but also a prolonged call for um, continued aid to a, an area. How would you say the media is handling this? Are they successful or are they lacking? It's funny. Dr. Oh. Oh. oh, no, Sorry. go ahead. Go ahead. Um, in terms of long-term response, I think I don't think the media has done a very good job in terms of continuity. And as I've seen, you can hear from the discussions here, you know, what we report is what makes people respond. And most often, when I worked, for example, in Africa, when a reporter comes, all they want to see is a malnourished child, 
And that's very good because here and now that child needs to be fed. But once just that child is fed, you need food so that they don't go back to malnutrition again. And that's an area apparently which does not attract donors, it does not attract the media, and it doesn't attract humanitarian assistance uh, workers who are involved. And I think that's an area where we also need journalists or whoever it is to work together with public health responders to do more research. How can we educate the donors? Because most of these things comes down to who is giving the dollars, and we go where the dollars are coming in. So it's a matter of us working together. It's still not well done, but we still need to do a lot of work together as a team to find a way of really reaching a tipping point so that people know when the emergency phase ends and the population is stabilizing a bit, that is when they need us even more so that they don't go back to the crisis. Dr. James. No, I, I, um, I, can, I concur. I, I was just thinking before you asked that question about everything seems to be, in terms of the journalism and the reporting, just in the moment, just in the immediate aftermath of, of the disaster. And um, nothing happens, you know, beyond that. You know, people don't talk about it after that. So, it, you know, it's a very, sh you know, people's memories are very, very short. So it doesn't enhance long-term overall public health sorts of um, interventions. So I agree. Dr. Ronan. One area that I think needs to be looked at is how we use the media. Okay, so the NGOs, the military, they have very conscious strategies about making sure Sean Penn is out there. Um, you know, the military has more public affairs officers on board than surgeons. And, and then they have those same stories going out across the area. So it's a very interesting, it's a very symbiotic relationship that needs to be looked at more if you are a beneficiary of these services because it can take away a little bit of the focus. And raising $50 million is great, but how you spend it is more important. So, yeah. And Dr. Nate Deckerson. Yeah, I, I think your point is well taken is that in terms of coverage, there's generally a beginning point, which is somewhat usually immediately after a big event. And then there's an ending point generally because, most often because there's another big disaster, there's another thing to, to draw attention. It reminds me a little bit of, as a media culture, uh, and not as a media expert, but that for many years, I don't even know if they still do it, but we'd have laugh tracks, which would be kind of a cue to somebody that, to the whole audience, that some, something funny was just said, like they, they wouldn't know that themselves. That there was sort of this, um, people get conditioned to, you just got a cue that this is this is funny, and I think in some way there's this cue that oh this is the next big thing that we need to pay attention to. We just we've moved off of that one. This is now where we we as a whole group need to go. And if you're if you're a good person and humanitarian, this is where we need to go. And it's 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 just kind of a part. It's become part of the culture, and so you see everybody knows when you're on the ground you're going to have a limited attention. There's going to be a limited attention to this. And like the person who was shot and in a wheelchair for the next 30 years, it ha the, the damage has not healed at that point. And so that is a real challenge. How do you tell that story? How do you tell the story of the ongoing struggle? It's not, it's not sexy. It's not glamorous. It, it's, it's, it's people with diarrhea. In a, it's not, uh, and, but it's, it's the ongoing. It's the, it's the context that made this whole thing so horrible in the first place. And I don't know how that story gets told in a way that people can understand it. And the problem of another headline cropping up three weeks later. Sure. Limited resources that mean crews get pulled out, reporters get pulled out. We're 20 minutes over our time, folks. I know that all of our panelists would be happy to answer your questions. Our thanks to Dr. Thea James, Dr. Larry Ronan, Dr. Nate Nickerson, and Dr. Monica Anyango.